Last week, we talked about the growth cycles of life, both physically and spiritually. We start out as a very young infant, and then uh, eventually we grow up and mature. Hopefully, you're on the journey somewhere and continuing to uh, get stronger and wiser and even more prepared for life. Sometimes that doesn't happen until we get a little bit older, but that's how life works. Uh, and today I thought we'd talk a little bit about this growing faith that sometimes we do discuss. Oftentimes we may go to Hebrews chapter 11, where we'll be able to see all these great people of faith, the definition of faith, examples of faith, and one of those is that of Abraham. And we spent quite a bit of time looking at Abraham. Hebrews 11 deals a lot with Abraham and Moses, kind of the two uh, people in the Jewish mind anyway. Abraham is the father of faith, and then Moses is the lawgiver, and those two hand in hand uh, is kind of really what the Jewish people put their whole lives into and built you know, their whole uh, way of worship and just the way God wanted them to live was, was really based on faith and law. But in Hebrews, it also talks about this woman, the woman Sarah. And we want to talk about a growing faith, because that's what she needed. Now, Abraham did too. He was struggling, right, from time to time. And she struggled as well. And, you know, while we look at faith and talk about faith, sometimes we realize that we don't have as much faith as we would like, and sometimes we still have doubts, and we have questions, and we still don't know exactly what to do sometimes. And so faith wanes, or sometimes wavers, and we want to grow, but there's encouragement even in Hebrews 11 to say, you know, just because you have challenges, it doesn't mean it's over. It doesn't mean like God's given up on you or God's given up on the promise. And so we want to talk about Sarah because she, she is one who is mentioned. And even from the Bible reading today, we learn a little bit more about Sarah. But in Hebrews chapter 11, it says this specifically about Sarah. And I'm guessing we read through it so quickly, we hardly even noticed she was there. I mean, I wonder if we started the lesson today by saying, do you know Sarah's in Hebrews 11? Like, no, Abraham is. Sarah's not even mentioned. And if she is, we don't really talk about what this really means. But here she is a woman of faith. And yet she is also a woman of doubt and a woman of questions. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive. This was God's doing. It was God's promise, and it had to be God's doing that she would have a baby, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. And yet you read the story in the book of Genesis, and you don't really see a whole lot of act of faith on Sarah's part. You see a, even a questioning faith on Abraham's part. But what is this? She's, she considered him. That's God faithful. He's able to do that. He will do it. I mean, how did that ever happen? And so we see the events unfolding. I don't know how all the events unfold in our life as God works in us and through us, and sometimes even through other people and through other events in life to help us that we can grow in our faith. And so we want to spend some time just looking at really the Genesis part and even some application, even by the time it gets to the New Testament. So Genesis chapter 16 God had already made the promise that they were going to have a child. It's going to be a child of promise. You remember Abraham was going to be the father of many nations. And I think in their mind, they thought, we're not going to have a big family, but at least we need to have one baby so that we can continue on. This is going to be the son of promise. And yet Sarah, at some point, was, I guess, getting frustrated. Maybe she saw the frustration even in her own husband. And she said, this is not working. What can we do? And so she said this, Sarah said to Abraham, her husband, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. So evidently she knows that somehow God's involved. God could open her womb, but now God has closed her womb. She's not having any babies. So go to my servant, that it may, that, uh, it may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah. So she came up with this idea. Well, you know, I'm old. I'm 80. Abraham's, well, Abraham's 87, so she would have been about 77. So, getting a little bit old to have kids. And realizing, if I've not had any children yet, we're probably not having children now, right? And again, that's what the Hebrew says. She's well past the age of having children. So, she's not having children in the prime of life. The idea that she would have children now is highly unlikely. And maybe God is allowing this to happen 
So we'd realize that this is God. It wasn't just, oh, well, everybody has a baby when they're young. You know, it's just the way life works, you know. No, this wasn't just a natural pregnancy and a natural childbirth. This was, only God could do this. And so we would look at it and say, yeah, God is faithful. But the fact is, God doesn't always come through when we think he should. Sometimes it's delayed. Sometimes we have to wait. Sometimes we have to trust. But it seems like Sarah, in her growing faith, this son is kind of saying, I'm kind of done trusting God. I can come up with another plan. We can do this ourselves without God. We don't need to inquire of God. We can just do this, and bang, we've, we've fulfilled the promise ourselves. We've done it. And sometimes we may do that. We may kind of go beyond what God wants us to do. We may not be willing to trust and wait. And that's the challenge that she was having. Where do we go from here? What's the next step? What should we do? And so she kind of left God out of the picture. In Genesis chapter 18 and verse 11, Abraham and Sarah, already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed. This is from the Bible verses today. She laughed as she thought, I'm worn out and my Lord is old. Will I now have this pleasure? So, so she just thinks, maybe it's not funny. Like, it's not like LOL, right? It's kind of like, this is like ridiculous. There's no way. Maybe at some point in her life, she's even thinking, how do you know if I want to have children now? It's not going to be easy at this age. So like, really, this is going to happen now? Now that I'm old, now that I'm past childbearing years? And so she laughs. And so I didn't really intend this to be a funny lesson, but it kind of is, you know, because she's laughing at something, maybe the impossibility of this ever happening. Can't believe it. Actually, it says she laughed to herself. She kind of laughed maybe under her breath. And then she was even exposed at that, saying, you did laugh. It's not even like we heard you laugh. We know you laughed. But she was doubting, and she was questioning, and she was wondering. You know why? Because at this point, she already has a son. It's not really hers. It's a stepson. It was Abraham's son with, with a servant girl. And he, he's like 13 years old now. We already have. And, and he's just starting to be a teenager. He wants us to start all over again. Like just, and even Abraham was saying that. Let's just keep the one we have. We're okay with him. It's Ishmael. He can be the child of promise. We don't need to do more. But that wasn't God's plan. And sometimes people, maybe you and I sometimes, instead of following what God's plan is, what God's promise is, what God's word is, we say, that's not making sense, that's not working out. You know, in this situation, it's a circumstance, it's different, it's a time, it's a culture thing, you know, and, and i got to work it out myself. It's the only way it's going to happen. Instead of just saying, I'm going to continue to trust in God. So how is this going to work now as we continue thinking about this progress in Genesis chapter 20? There's a couple things that really go from chapter 17 to chapter 21. Now one is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So Abraham and Sarah were kind of witnesses to the judgment of ungodly people. But now as they're traveling around, now they come to this city called Gerar, and Abraham is afraid again. This is not the first time he's felt this way. Like even my wife, and you know, she's in her 70s. Actually, at this point, maybe almost 90. 90 years old. And still attractive, I guess. But he's afraid of, of the king. And so that's when he says, you know, tell him you're my sister. And you remember what happened there? God sent a message to the king. And at the end of the chapter, what happens is God closed up all the wombs of all the women in this city. I mean, nobody's going to be having babies. So God's able to do that, close the womb. But as soon as he realized what he was doing, and actually he didn't actually, we would say, do anything, 
because God had prevented him from sinning. But when that was rectified, when people were back to doing what they should be doing, including Abraham and not giving his wife away, including Sarah, you know, not going, and including the king, you remember what God did? It says he opened up everybody's womb. And maybe at that point is when Sarah got faith. To see God has power over sin and wickedness of people, Sodom and Gomorrah, chapter 19. This is chapter 20. He has the power to open and close wombs. And God's able to work through that. And so she's saying, if God can do that, he can work in me. I can trust in him. Because again, you read it, Hebrews 11, it says, well, Sarah had faith. And you read through all the scriptures, like, where, where is this said faith? Where's that described? And I think that's where it is, where she recognizes God has the power. So God, through events and through circumstances, through expressing and showing his power, that she's able to realize, I need to trust in God and not think we can do it any other way. And so she became fully obedient to God working in her life. So in Genesis chapter 21, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time which God had spoken to him. At this point, Abraham is 100 and Sarah is 90. And Ishmael is about 14. Causes a lot of problems, even within the family. But God is faithful. God did what he said he would do. And so it's a growing faith. It's, it's working through a lot of issues. And maybe that is encouragement to us to say, here these people in Hebrews 11 are called people of faith, and I can't really keep up to that. But, you know, you look at Sarah, and there's plenty of other people you can look at in, in Hebrews that they were not always strong in faith. And so that's sometimes an encouragement to us. Say, I'm not always strong in faith. It's like, okay, we'll just continue to grow. Continue to work through doubts, continue to trust God even when you don't really see how this is ever going to work out. And she was able to do that. And God was able to bless them. And God continued to work in their life. Genesis chapter 21 and verse 6, and Sarah said, God has brought me laughter. And it's kind of, whoa, hang on. She laughed when the promise was, your, 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 your wife will have a child. He laughs. And now she's laughing again. But this is a different kind of laughter. This is the laughter of joy. This is the laughter of contentment. This is the laughter of God did something so miraculous. And now I have a child of my own. And everyone hears about this will laugh at me. Kind of laugh with me. Laugh. In other words, it's, again, it's not the, it's not the, you know, we think about being funny. I mean, it's kind of funny if you think about it. It's glad it's not me. But it's the joy. It's the joy that brings. It's the joy of the promise. It's the joy of God working because through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, the Messiah is going to come. And that's what we're going to rejoice in. And God works in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. And so we rejoice that God worked in this way. And she said, who would have said to Abraham and Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in old age. And so she saw, witnessed, was a part of this great promise that God had been working on for many years. But maybe he was just waiting for her faith and for his faith to get strong and for God to be able to show in a very miraculous way. But you know, you, you probably know, maybe you didn't know, Abraham laughed too. It wasn't just Sarah. Back in Genesis 17, Abraham fell down and he laughed and he said, 
Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, now what, what's he saying? He's saying, God, we've got it all figured out. We've gone the worldly way. We've used worldly thinking. We used, you know, worldly logic. We've got the son of pro. That's what he's saying. Why don't we just keep Ishmael? Forget having more babies. We got Ishmael. Just make him the child of promise. God's saying, no, that, that's not the plan. You know what God's saying? Like he says many times, if you're carefully reading the Old Testament, God says, that's not my plan, that's your plan. You, 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 like you remember, it's kind of like the people thought, we need a king. Why do we need a king? Because we want to be like everybody else. We want to fit in. We want to be like the world. Didn't work out very well, did it? So God says, well, choose yourself a king. And they said, well, look at Saul. He looks like a good choice. What were they, what were they basing that on? A worldly decision. He was strong, he was tall, and he was good looking. Just a terrible king, but other than that, you know, he looks good. So they're thinking from a very worldly point of view. God's saying, that's not my plan. That's your plan. You're going to go ahead with your plan anyway. So they went ahead with it. But when you do things from a worldly viewpoint, it doesn't work. And God's saying, no, Ishmael's not the child of promise. God's got his plan that he's going to continue to work out. So even, obviously, Abraham struggled with this idea of having a child. And yet God blessed them. God was willing to work. In John chapter 8 and verse 56, Jesus is talking to the religious leaders. They're doubting who he is. They don't even know where he's come from. And Jesus had already said, you know, before Abraham I was. And they're like, well, you're, you're not even 40 years old. You know, what do you mean? You were around 2,000 years ago. That seems pretty funny. Oh, but look what he says. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. Rejoice. That's the idea of laugh. Happy. Glad. Somehow Abraham saw it. Now, he didn't have it all figured out. I know exactly what she's going to do, when he's going to be born, and how it's... But he knew the promise is going to be fulfilled, that the Messiah was going to come. He didn't know when or how or who, but he knew it. He says, Abraham, he rejoiced. Even back then, he rejoiced in my day. He rejoiced that I would be coming. He was glad. Now, Abraham, as kind of Jesus was inferring, like, he's your hero. He's your guy. He's the, the person that you look up to. But he was looking for me. He was waiting for me. He was thinking about me. He had me in mind when God was saying, you're going to have the son of promise. That's going to be fulfilled in God's great plan. Abraham saw it. He was glad. He was rejoicing. He was glad in God working. We don't know exactly the, the verse we just read about, about when Abraham laughed because his posture was a little bit different. You remember how he laughed? He was actually already on the ground. I don't think he was on the ground because he was laughing so hard. I think he was on the ground because he was worshiping. And somehow he had this joy that God was actually going to do something that's unbelievable. Almost the joy is kind of like, I don't even think this is a good idea, but I'm happy. I don't think this is really going to work necessarily, but I'm happy, right? Because God is able to do it. So God provided these situations and circumstances and events and these revelations that would definitely be fulfilled. So Psalm 30 and verse 11, you've turned for me my mourning into dancing. You've loosened my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you evermore. So how God, how God is able to do that, to take our sorrows, our disappointments, our doubts, our discouragements, our frustrations, take all of that and he changes it around to faith, to love, to joy, to trust. He's able to take us in the middle of the struggle and change it into where we can rejoice. And sometimes even in the struggle to say, I still have peace and contentment because I know God is with me. God's going to see me through and God's not giving up. God's got a promise even for me.
And if you're unsure of that, we just read through the New Testament to find out what is God's promise for his children. And if you're a child of God, you can say, that's what God is going to do. I don't know how it's all going to work out. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I can trust him and know that he is faithful. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 12, Therefore from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as, as, innu as innumerable as the grains of sand by the seashore. God has the power, and he is going to continue to work. This is fulfilled several times in the New Testament. But one time specifically, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 21, and Paul uses this as an analogy. For it, is that it was written that Abraham would have two sons. One by a slave woman, and one by the free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh. What, what does that mean? While the son of the free woman was born through the promise. God had given the promise. Abraham and Sarah said, we will do it our own way. We will do it according to the way of the world, according to the flesh. I mean, they were both born, born in the same way. And you think even Ishmael, I mean, they weren't exactly teenagers when she gave birth to him. But one was born according to the flesh, according to man's way. The other was born according to God's promise, God's way. So they name him Isaac. And you probably may know this already. Isaac means the one who laughs. We're actually laughing now he's born, and we're going to call him laughter. And, and maybe that's a sign. Everybody who kind of says, why is your name laughter? You probably say, well, did you meet my parents at school the other day? They were picking me up, right? That'd be pretty funny. But he's called laughter because he is the promise. He's the joy giver, the joy bringer, the one who God is going to work. And so he was that one of laughter. So God blessed Abraham and Sarah with a baby. Now, now again, Sarah was 90 years old. I don't know if it was more difficult for a 90-year-old to raise a child than others, but you would think that she'd waited her whole life to have a child, and now in her later years, she has a baby. But the fact is that in the Old Testament, and it's interesting, you kind of wonder, why would the Bible even say this? My understanding, there's only one woman in the Old Testament that it tells us how old she was when she died. Oh, you'll probably never guess who it is. In Genesis 23, in verse 1, Sarah lived 127 years. 127 years old. You know what that means? She had 37 years with the promised child. It's not like she just had the baby and died in her old age. She had many years with the son that she had been waiting for. For most of her life. And so God continued to bless her, even with long life, that she could enjoy the promise, even herself. But we're the ones who really enjoy and benefit and have this blessing from the promise. God is a God of promise, and he calls us to have this same type of faith, to trust in him, believe in him, to follow him. And, and I know we, we all still struggle through this. Walking by faith sometimes is a struggle. We're, we're not always where we ought to be. We don't, we're not always as strong as we need to be. But we know God will continue to work, and he will continue to strengthen us, even when we fall or even when we doubt. We always offer an invitation. If you want to be in a relationship with God, part of his family, you can be born again through the waters of baptism. If you are willing to surrender your life fully, completely, totally to follow the Lord, to trust in him and allow him to work in your life and to change you to become someone that you could never be on your own. Again, we're not talking about you becoming something of the world by worldly means or worldly power or worldly wisdom. We're talking about God 
doing a miraculous work in your life to change you. More than anything, to change your relationship with him and to change your destiny. If we can encourage you, let's stand. We'll sing this song.